Karen Gardner. I'm a senior studying psychology and sustainability here at UT. I'm also interning with the Office of Sustainability. And I just want to let you guys know that UT Sustainability Symposium is happening tomorrow. Um, I thought it might be of interest to some of y'all, like students and attendees of the class, just because they talk about some energy-related things. So it is from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. in the EER. You do not have to stay all day. It's a come-and-go event. But um, if you Google UT Sustainability Symposium 2019, you can find out who's speaking and what they're speaking about if anyone wants to attend. So thank you for letting me announce this. Thank you for that announcement. Is this picture the peregrine falcon that hangs out on the tower? Or don't? No? It's just, it's, just, it's just a peregrine falcon. Okay. So it's, it's not the UT Tower Girl. Okay. I'll introduce today's speaker. Before we do, next week is uh, another local person, UT Austin. It'll be Kara Cockleman. She'll be talking about some recent research that she's done about autonomous vehicles and the impact on emissions and energy uh, of autonomous vehicles. Are they going to drive less? Are they going to drive more? And what are the... Uh, impacts from autonomous vehicles in general from an environmental and uh, resource perspective. Uh, so that'll be next week. It'll be the, our Halloween talk. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Frank Mayle. So Frank is a postdoctoral fellow and, and working in the Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering Department and has previously worked with uh, the Bureau of Economic Geology folks in the Jackson School of Geosciences. Uh, Frank has co-authored uh, a, a paper uh, in 2013, or I guess when did the paper come out? Was 2013. 2013, so received the Cozzarelli Prize uh, in 2013. Him and his co-authors, one of which is here, Dr. Michael Martyr, uh, as well as Tad Patsek, who used to be here at UT Austin in the Petroleum Department. And their, their paper was Gas Production and the Barnett Shale Obeys a Simple Scaling Theory, so they came up with a way to summarize the uh, production from uh, natural gas shales in a general way so that you can compare uh, production from all kinds of uh, natural gas plays. So today Frank is going to give us a talk on sort of physics, uh, fracturing physics of uh, tidal oil production uh, and I guess some other uh, tidbits about uh, material inputs and things of this nature and some trends. So he's going to put sort of hydraulic fracturing of oil and gas in the context of the last, I don't know, decade or so. Um, so we're going to learn from one of the experts who's been studying this uh, for several, uh, several years now. So Frank, thanks for coming, and uh, let's welcome Frank here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the introduction, Kerry. All right, so I am going to talk a little bit about technology progress and physical constraints on uh, tight oil production. And we will just jump right in and see if this thing progresses through slides. It does. Okay. So daily oil uh, consumption for the globe has increased quite a, bot, quite a bit in the last 40 to 50 years. And uh, here I've decided to show it in terms of uh, one of these super tankers. So this is the most modern like, 2015 super tanker that can hold 3.1 million barrels of oil and back in 1970 we were consuming about one of these tankers a day and now we're up to more about three of these tankers a day and you can see uh, you know there have been a few dips but for the most part it's been going up fairly linearly uh, all of the green energy that has been brought on has not really changed this trend it's still going up now, on the other hand, uh, tight oil production, before there was tight oil production in the U.S., uh, the U.S. energy production was decreasing. So here's that same tanker for scale. And then here we have all of the lower, eight, uh, the lower 48 production, so excluding Canada and uh, Alaska. And you can see that it was uh, reaching its peak around the time that uh, it was responsible for uh, eight to nine million barrels of oil a day, which is more than the total consumption. And now uh, it's uh, not doing quite so hot up until 2008 or so when the tight oil production really started to kick off in the U.S. And then you can see that after that, uh, when this has gone up, this has gone up, when we've got this little dip, it's all because of the tight oil production. 
So tight oil is now the swing player that uh, really controls how much oil the U.S. is going to be producing each day. And uh, here are a couple of the major basins that we've got, the Permian Basin in blue, the Bakken in orange, the Eagle Ford in green, and some other formations as well. So uh, we have assembled a team that Carrie is a part of, you are, that is studying uh, how the uh, globe is going to react to tight oil production and uh, what this means as far as uh, making a transition into renewable energy. And among the team members, we've got Ian Duncan, who is a geochemist originally, Robin Domus, who is a geomodeler, and Larry Lake, who is the foremost expert on EOR, uh, enhanced oil recovery processes. And he was responsible somewhat for arresting this decline. So it could have gone a lot worse if it weren't for that guy. Michael Martyr, who has been working since the beginning of uh, tight oil production on understanding shales. And Carrie King, who needs no further introduction. OK, for an outline of this talk, uh, we're going to go into what makes hydraulic fracturing or fracking unique, how does it work, and uh, as a uh, uh, our required joke, is hydraulic fracturing all it's cracked up to be? We will answer that question possibly, and then see a little bit about what is next. So hydraulic fracturing is quite a bit different from previous technologies. You've seen that it led to a lot of uh, increase in the overall production. Um, here on the right, we can see that the spatial scale is quite a bit bigger. So we're talking about county-sized, multi-county-sized, um, Pennsylvania-sized plays here. Uh, there's quite a bit more logistics that's involved in these sort of efforts. And the uh, production rates decline far faster for these. Uh, jumping into the spatial scale, so the largest uh, shale oil producers that I showed before, the Bakken, which is still in green. I've managed consistent coloring there. Um, the Nyabrara here in purple. The Eagle Ford that's still in blue. And the Permian Basin, which is uh, the largest of them all. Here is a different look at the uh, Permian Basin to give you an idea of just how long they've been studying uh, this particular area before they found the tight oil or found a way to produce the tight oil. Here we have a cross section that was made in the 1940s by the West Texas Geological Survey. And here we've got a, uh, a top of one of the original formations that was being drilled. And then here we've got the two basins where most of the production comes from today. As far as the logistics go, here is a typical um, uh, fracking test site. So we have these wellheads here, 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 and here. Then we've got all of these pumps and all of these pumps. And then we've got these tanks over here that are blending all of the sand, all of the frac water, all of the chemicals together. And then they're going into these pumps and then being injected into these wells. And then here we go with the risky move. OK, not quite yet. Um, then the decline rates from these wells. So here are uh, the four major tight oil plays. And you can see that in the first two years, you lose 80% plus of your production. They're declining really quickly. Here we have a conventional field for comparison. Um, so let me tell you the story of this field. It was discovered in the 1940s. So they drilled one well, and it declined pretty quickly. But that was OK. So they drilled another 100 wells, but those were declining. Notice that they're declining a lot less steeply than these. OK. Then they drilled another 400 wells, and they accidentally hit the gas cap. So they lost a lot of production. And then, and once they had that figured out, it took them about a year to figure that out, that went on a standard decline. 
and it was going along with a loss of two-thirds of its production over a three-year period. And then the Railroad Commission told them to shut down their wells, so they did briefly. And then the Railroad Commission told them that they could start them back up again, and they did. And then they were starting to get to the point where they didn't know what to do with this field, so they started injecting water, and it jumped right back up here. So, you know, standard, simple sort of thing that is why we have so many petroleum engineers around here. So the technology progress in hydraulic fracturing, the first thing was getting to the point that hydraulic fracturing actually worked. No one really believed that it was going to work. Uh, there is a documentary out there on George Mitchell that goes into his work on his 20-year um, crazy crusade to try and get oil out of, well, gas mostly, out of the ground through hydraulically fracturing it. And he eventually succeeded uh, beyond his wildest dreams. And that is how we got to here. But um, he was fortunate because in this tight oil uh, life cycle, the exploration was already done. He knew that this field was here. He had uh, the property overlying it to test with. And then he could continue uh, trying to complete these wells and trying to produce from them. And then he wouldn't get anything. So he'd go back to iterating. And over a 20-year period, he got to the point where it actually started working. It was producing an economic value. And uh, other people came in and started doing it as well. And then after another 20 years, uh, we moved to this sort of setup. So this is a horizontal well that uh, Schlumberger has um, found. And they were responsible for completing. And here are all of the fractures that they believe that they created from it. Here we have a cloud of seismic events where something somewhere broke in roughly this vicinity. And that's responsible for all of these points. And I'm going to now try to play a video. Kind of shows how this goes. All right, so clear as mud, right? All right, and replay that. OK, so first they're drilling this well. Then they take it horizontal. This goes for one to two miles. Then they use a perforating gun in order to make a bunch of uh, seed fractures and start injecting a lot, as in millions of gallons of water and millions of pounds of sand. And hopefully they end up uh, producing a decent amount of fluid as a result of all of that. And here's kind of a quick look at how that has gone. Here we have the average lateral length of these wells in a particular basin. And it started out at around 3,000 feet. I use kilofeet because that's a perfectly normal unit. So they started out at around 3,000 feet here in 2002. Then they were up to about a mile. And then they decided, why not go for two miles? So they went for two miles, and they've been uh, expanding ever since. And here we look at the injection intensity. So how many gallons for each of these lateral feet were injected? They started out with none. So in this particular basin, the, uh, the Bakken of the Williston Basin, they started out without even trying to complete them. They just drilled a horizontal well, and they hoped that the oil would come out of the formation and come into this and produce. And it worked, but not terribly well. So they decided to start fracking it because they saw what George Mitchell was doing. And 
they started by putting in somewhere around 100 feet or 100, pound, um, 100 gallons of water for each foot. So it, um, I'm not going to do math. And they ended up at over 1,000 gallons per feet, which is a nice round number that I can multiply. So we're talking 1,000 gallons, uh, 10,000 feet. We're at the 10 million gallon range. So larger than most pools, I think, for each of these wells. And then they've also increased the number of stages that they did. So they started out with zero or one stage. And at this point, they occasionally go to 75 stages where they go through this whole process for each of those stages and just sequentially try to knock it out within a couple of days. So a stage is uh, the, um, all right, here we are. So if we start here. So a stage is one of these collections. So these two, uh, these two um, planes, we'll assume that they're planes, are coming out of this one stage. So this particular well has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 stages. So if we go over here, then select about 12 stages, we're talking a 2010 vintage well. Now they've increased the number of stages by three or four more times. Okay, um, as a result of all of this progress, there has been a large increase in the oil that is produced in the first year. So here we have the first year of oil production. Here we have the date that the well began production. And you can see that it uh, started out close to 50,000 barrels in the first year, and now it's more than 150. So a threefold increase in how much they're making over the first year. Now, there are physical constraints to this tight oil production. Um, here is a figure out of uh, the Patsik PNAS article that is used heavily. And here we have a cartoon vision of what the well would look like with a nice straight lateral and perfectly planar fractures. And then this sort of repeatable flow unit that has a certain height, a certain distance to the neighbor, and a certain length that we multiply by two. And the flow is just from some random point here to the nearest fracture there. And then just recently we've uh, extracted the basics of that model, attempted to justify not changing any of the assumptions, and uh, used it for shale oil wells. So uh, this physical constraint given that model, is that the oil you ultimately get out is a very small fraction of the oil that is originally there. So here I've got something off of Paul Glover's uh, notes on formation evaluation. Um, he's got three curves, but we're going to focus on this one, which is uh, the one that is relevant for tight oil wells. And you can see that you start out with 100% reservoir pressure, you drop to nearly none, and you've produced 20% of the oil. So that means there's 80% that is just not coming. Now, given these, how is the technology advancement changing production? I was thinking of leaving this as an exercise to the class. How engaged does everyone look? All right, we'll take a hand pull. Is it accessing more oil? So is the technology advancement leading to longer heights, longer widths, and more oil that is in there? Or is it accessing that same amount of oil faster? So everyone for accessing more oil, please raise your hand. Four, five, six, seven. Okay. Who thinks it's accessing that oil faster? More than seven.
Okay, let's look at some, uh, some production rates. So here I've split all of these wells by the year that they were put on production. I'm showing how many years they're on production. And here we have their rate in 1,000 barrels per month. And let's start in 2004. So it came up a little bit. It started producing 5,000 barrels a month. And then it kind of just settled. And then each year, it's been doing a little better to the point that a 2018 well is starting out by producing 20,000 barrels in its first few months. And then it drops precipitously. And if you take, if it follows the same pattern that the 2017 well does, then it's going to be pretty close to the, uh, the older well by year two or three. Really tempted to try that pull again right now. If I look at the ultimate production that we expect out of these wells, then between uh, 2006 and 2008, it increased. Since then, it hasn't. So we've seen these wells getting more intense. They're getting longer. They are doing their best to access as much oil as possible but they're not increasing the ultimate production. So, are we accessing more oil? We're accessing oil faster. Someone whispering. Faster? Faster. Okay. Let's look at it this way. So if I take some strange units, which is a, a, a years per foot squared. Don't ask why. And I try plotting that. Then I end up that after 2010, nothing has changed. We're pretty much stuck right here. We're just accessing the oil faster. Now, uh, we've got a hypothesis. We've done some observation. Uh, it's a good time to try uh, testing that hypothesis. So in 2001, Jerome Friedman, who was thinking really hard about uh, biology problems, I think, for the most part, uh, came up with a, a uh, advanced machine learning method that he called, um, he called greedy function approximation. And today, that is now uh, usually called gradient boosting. And he immediately saw the value of uh, gradient boosting as a machine learning method in order to take a couple variables and plot the response surface based on those variables, what you would expect to see out of it. So using this sort of approach, I will try to answer the question, how is technology advancement changing production using this machine learning here? So I took a model. Uh, he's been convenient enough to put that code open source, and a lot of people have uh, written on it and iterated on it. And uh, here I've got the measurements versus the predictions. It's not a very good fit. It's got an R squared of 0.6 but it might be useful for our purposes. And I found that the uh, relative importance of each of these features, we've got a water cut that's really important. We've got the length, one of the technology things that has been changing. We have the initial reservoir pressure, something that has not been changing. The X and Y locations, how much fluid is injected. So the technology has been changing how much you produce, but it's kind of swamped by how much water is in the formation initially. It's kind of a bummer. Uh, to reiterate on that sort of approach, uh, I've looked at SHAP values, and these are values where uh, you take the model, you start shuffling features, and you try to use some complicated math about called cooperative game theory. Cooperative. And based on how much 
explanation each of these factors gives to that particular prediction, you assign a payout that is cooperative game theory. And uh, then we've got for each one of these points, we've got one well. And we figured out how much of it is responsible for how much the water cut is responsible for the EUR, how much the GUR, the initial pressure, the profit per length, the lateral length, and the number of stages. So it's good that you asked what a stage was. As it turns out that it's a little important. And the order has changed. Yes, the GOR is the gas oil ratio. So it is another property that is based on more on what the formation is like than what the uh, actual technology is like. So our first three uh, parameters here are not technology at all. Last, our second three parameters are all technology. So technology definitely matters here, but it isn't really changing how much you're ultimately going to produce. But does it change how well or how quickly these wells decline? Yes. Here when we're doing, uh, we're predicting how quickly these wells decline, the most important parameters are the number of stages, the distance to the nearest well, how much injected fluid there is, how much injected sand there is. And then we've got some geologic parameter here, pressure likes to show up. Uh, does the well have close neighbors? What is the well's length? What is the depth that they have drilled to here? And if we go back to the shap values to look at that, once again, our number of stages is very important, our fluid per length, our distance to the nearest neighbor, and the lateral length. So it turns out that um, technology has been impacting things. And it might even be impacting things in a way that helps the economics, but it does not lead to better wells in this particular case. Not much. So for takeaway points, this hydraulic fracturing has revitalized U.S. oil production. The hydraulic fracturing technology is still progressing, but the ultimate production is not increasing anymore because I can't emphasize this enough. You cannot cheat physics. You can't. You can't cheat physics. You can accelerate production, and that might be valuable, but you cannot cheat the physics. So with that, I would like to acknowledge all of the people who I have been working with these last few years. I would like to thank the people who have been kind enough to send money my way in order to study this stuff, and thank you for listening. And then I'll open it up for questions. Yes. Uh, so you'd like a description of the reservoir? Um, all right, let's see. Okay, so this so is the Bakken right here. Um, it's got a, it is a 
called by, uh, by some people in the industry more of a transitional play. So rather than being a true unconventional play, you can produce a little bit from uh, unstimulated wells. And this is because it has a relatively high permeability. It has a relatively high porosity for a tight oil play. And there's been a little bit of migration. Uh, more questions? Or is that thing broken? Well, I can repeat questions. So you never mentioned cost, and whether a well is good or bad, so far as the investors are concerned, probably depends on how much they cost as well as everything else. Um, there was an article just a few days ago indicating that uh, many of the companies doing the drilling are running into severe financial problems and are about to explore new financial instruments. So any comments on the intersection of cost and production and technology? Well, uh, probably fortunately for these companies, they have never laid out their books for me, and uh, I'm not quite sure who they have. So I can't really speak to what the true costs are, but uh, certainly going through the sort of technology improvement that they have done has been a very expensive endeavor. Uh, they had to spend a lot up front just buying the land and the permission to drill upon it. Uh, and accelerating production does mean that they have higher cash flow, but if that doesn't balance out the extreme cost of completion, then they'll end up losing. And if it does balance out, then uh, they will end up winning based on all of this. But I'm not sure that they're asking the right questions at this point about whether that will balance out. All right, thanks, Frank. So I have a, a question, see if you can give us a little bit more intuitive or whatever uh, insights required. Uh, in your Bakken example, they're basically drilling about twice as far as they were 10 or eight years ago, yet the amount of ultimate production, is you're saying, is roughly the same. So the yep. simple intuition says twice as long, maybe I get twice as much if yep. you're just getting oil from nearby where the well is. But this seems to not be the case, so how do we understand how a twice as long well with, mm -hmm. is it the, each fracture, at each length along the well isn't as good? Is it, you know, what is, is it, is the, were the quality of the rock better 10 years ago than now? What, what yes. are the? Yes, yes. The quality of the rock is better 10 years ago than it was now. So they are doing their best to squeeze as much as they can uh, out of the rock that is available, which has a higher water cut because it is, uh, it's poor rock. So they've done an amazing job of keeping the production relatively similar to what it was 10 years ago, a very expensive job, uh, mainly because they don't have as much good rock. Can you estimate the ultimate production from one of these fields? Uh, yes. I think that I can. There are a large number of economic assumptions that go into that. Uh, but we do have at least one paper out there where we attempt to estimate the ultimate production of the Bakken. I don't remember the number. Another question. Um, mm -hmm. What happens to the natural gas? I know there are not a lot of pipelines out there. Yes, so uh, in the Bakken, uh, there are some pictures taken of the Bakken at night from satellites, and you see it is lit up like a Christmas tree because they're taking a lot of that natural gas and flaring it. Oh, oh yeah. it's, it's working. So, um, fracking it utilizes a lot of fresh water, which can be challenging in 
places where it's really arid mm -hmm. so uh, my question is about if it's possible to utilize the saline water that comes back to the surface the flow back water is it possible to utilize it back in fracking and if not what are the technological challenges uh, of not using the saline water what can mm -hmm. go wrong uh, let me start with uh, whether it's possible to use the saline water that's coming back, and the answer is generally yes. Uh, I know that at least one operator in the Permian Basin, where it's pretty dry, uh, utilizes 90 plus percent of the water that is flown back for uh, hydraulic fracturing their next wells. Uh, in the Eagle Ford, most of the water is coming from, uh, from somewhat saline water sources. Uh, as far as what happens when, when you're not utilizing that uh, water and you take it and inject it back into the uh, into, uh, adjacent formations, uh, there are groups at SMU, UT, and Oklahoma who are looking at induced seismicity from that sort of uh, operation. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, kind of piggybacking off of that question, uh, recently I've been seeing headlines about using carbon dioxide as a source um, rather than water in mm -hmm. arid areas where you have hydraulic fracturing wells. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could just speak on that. I haven't studied it in great detail. Uh, I have seen, so uh, one of the great qualities of water is that it's pretty darn incompressible, whereas CO2 is pretty darn compressible. And uh, I'm not sure how easy it is to uh, frack something with a pretty compressible gas. Thank you. Just from a complete layperson's perspective, there's half the words you've used, I don't even understand one, can't spell them anyway, is what I'm hearing just normal consumer that um, the fracking is expensive to do, it's helping them get the same amount of oil out just faster, but the cost to make that happen may not be worth getting it out faster. Correct. Is that correct? Yeah. Thank you completely understood my presentation, and I can't wait to let you give the slides the next time. That confusingly red means off. So I used to work on these frac sites. And we used to go to old frac sites and refrack them. What's mm -hmm. the reason for that? Uh, I think it's happened a few times. So generally, they uh, go in with the uh, technology that they had at the time and try to frack it. And they think that it's a good well. It should be a good well. Its neighbors are good wells, but it isn't. And therefore, they believe that there's a problem that they can solve by going in with new technology and fracking it again. <laughs> 